Susan Crawford, my next guest, has been driven to tell a story the powers that be would rather we forget. He found it by chance in documents buried deep in the recesses of the National Archives in our nation's capital. The discovery led him on a journey of 12 years that is now concluded with this beautifully written account of ugly horrors. Kill Anything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam by Nick Terse. As all of us know, there have been many memorable accounts of the terrible things done in Vietnam, memoirs, histories, documentaries, and movies. But Nick Terse has given us a fresh, holistic work that stands alone for its blending of history and journalism, for the integrity of research brought to life through the diligence of first-person interviews. Those interviews skillfully unlock the memories of American warriors and expose the wounds that, to this day, scar the hearts and minds of villagers who survived the scorched earth of Vietnam. Here is a powerful message for us today, a reminder of what war really costs. Ironically, Nick Terse wasn't even around as the Vietnam War raged. He was born in 1975, the year it ended. Not until 25 years later, while pursuing his Ph.D. in sociomedical sciences, did he discover the secret trove of documents that sent him on this long search. In addition to two earlier books and countless articles and essays, Nick Terse is managing editor of TomDispatch.com the indispensable website if you want the news powerful people would prefer to keep hidden. Nick Terse, welcome. Thanks for having me on. Of the more than 30,000 nonfiction books that have been published since the end of the war, this is one of the toughest. How did you come to write it? You weren't even born until the year the war ended in 1975. I really stumbled upon this project. Uh, I was a, a graduate student when I began it. And I was working on a project on post-traumatic stress disorder among U.S. Vietnam veterans. And I would go down to the National Archives just outside of D.C. And uh, I was looking for hard data to match up with uh, you know, self-report material, what veterans told us about their service. And on one of these trips, I was down there for about two weeks. And about every, uh, every research avenue that I, I pursued was a dead end. And I finally went to, uh, to an archivist that I worked with there. And I said to him, I, I can't go back to my boss empty-handed. I need something, at least a lead. And he you know, said a few words to me that really changed my life. He said, do you think that uh, witnessing war crimes could cause post-traumatic stress? And I said, you know, that's an excellent hypothesis. Uh, what do you have on war crimes? And within an hour, I was, uh, I was going through a collection of boxes, uh, thousands and thousands of pages of documents, uh, to call it a you know, information treasure trove is the wrong phrase. It was a, uh, a horror trove. Hmm. These were uh, reports of massacres, murders, mutilation, torture. Uh, and these were uh, investigations that were carried out by the U.S. military during the war, uh, a collection of documents called the Vietnam War Crimes Working Group Collection. And this was, um, this was a, a task force that was set up uh, in the Pentagon, and it was designed to track war crimes cases uh, in the wake of the exposure of the My Lai Massacre. Where 500 men, women, and children were murdered by American GIs. That's right. Uh, the military, uh, basically what they wanted to do was make sure they were never caught flat-footed again by an atrocity scandal. So in the Army Chief of Staff's office, there were a number of, uh, of Army colonels who worked to track all war crimes allegations that, uh, that bubbled up into the media, that, uh, that GIs and recently returned veterans were uh, making public, and uh, they tracked all of these, and whenever they could, they tried to tamp down these allegations. Your book is very important to me. I was there at the White House in the 1960s when President Johnson escalated the war. My own great regret is that I didn't see the truth of the war in time. Uh, didn't see what was happening there. And yet, as I said, you didn't even come to the experience until after it was all over, and yet you have become obsessed with telling this story. You had no money, you had no advance, you, didn't ha you had no means of support when you left graduate school to, to do this. I thought that this story was, uh, I, I really thought it was just too important. You know, I could never get those records out of my head. And, you know, then I, I went, uh, you know, I traveled the country, I, I spoke to a lot of uh, American witnesses and, and so perpetrators. You yeah. There are uh, 80 pages of notes in here, <laughs> tiny little notes. You're, you seem almost, determined that nobody would accuse you of not having sourced the information. 
Well, I, I, I know that this isn't, uh, it's not a popular narrative of the war, and, uh, you know, it's not, uh, they're, they're hard truths, and, and I know it's, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who are, are predisposed to, to disbelieve this. It is, in, in many cases, it's, it's, it's shocking and it's, it's hard to believe. This isn't, uh, this isn't the, the type of warfare that most Americans think that, uh, that their fellow Americans uh, pursue. But, um, so I, I wanted to make sure that it was uh, documented as, as meticulously as I could. And this is the story uh, of Vietnam veterans told by Vietnam veterans. I used uh, you know, hundreds of, of sworn uh, statements, sworn testimony uh, that, that uh, active duty GIs and recently returned veterans gave to Army criminal investigators. So it's, it's the veterans in their own words. Let me play for you what John Kerry said back in 1971 when he returned from Vietnam and he joined with other Vietnam veterans to talk about uh, the kind of war they had experienced. Here's what he said. Not isolated incidents, but crimes committed on a day-to-day -day basis with a full awareness of officers at all levels of command. It's impossible to describe to you the feelings of the men who are reliving their experiences in Vietnam. But they did. They relived the absolute horror of what this country, in a sense, made them do. Uh, they told the stories of times that they had personally raped, cut off ears, cut off heads, taped wires from portable telephones to human genitals and turned up the power, cut off limbs, blown up bodies, randomly shot at civilians, raised villages in a fashion reminiscent of Genghis Khan, shot cattle and dogs for fun, poisoned food stocks, and generally ravaged the countryside of South Vietnam. All these years later, this book you've been working on for 10 years, based upon these documents buried at the National Archives, confirm what John Kerry was saying then. Yes, uh, all the atrocities that Kerry mentions by name there, uh, I, I found evidence of, of all of those uh, uh, those types of crimes represented in the, the records of this Vietnam War Crimes Working Group in the, the government's own files. So at the same time that, um, you know, that, that uh, Kerry and, and the veterans that, that he uh, was referring to there were, were being smeared as, uh, as fake veterans or as liars, the military had all these records that, that proved that these were just the, the, the very crimes that were going on in Vietnam. And the military had these records in 2004 when John Kerry was being swift voted. That's right. Uh, you know, the, these records uh, existed then. There was proof at the time that the military, uh, they knew about it and they, they didn't disclose it to the public. And it was still, you know, under wraps when he was running. I mean, the, the military definitely didn't want these records out there. I, I talked to uh, several members of, of this Vietnam War Crimes Working Group, this Pentagon Task Force. And I asked one of the, the colonels who he ended up retiring as a, as a general. Uh, and he said that at the time he thought it was right, that these records uh, need to be kept secret. It was for the good of the country, for the good of the war effort. But in the years since, he recognized that, uh, that he, he thought it was the wrong thing to do. Uh, I talked to him during the Iraq War, and he said, you know, perhaps if these things had been aired at the time, if we had been honest with the American people and open with these records, then maybe we wouldn't have a had uh, Abu Ghraib, uh, you know, the, the, the torture scandal there. He, um, he, he came to see it as a, as a real failing on his part. What kind of reception did you get when you went out to call on these veterans who had been there, whose testimony was included in these secret files, and who, who must have been disturbed when this young reporter calls and said, I'd like to talk to you about war crimes in Vietnam? There were times when I had a, a door slammed shut in my face or or the phone slammed down on the receiver. Uh, but, but most of the time, uh, veterans were willing to talk. And a lot of them told me that they were, they were happy to, uh, to talk about it in some ways, even if we were talking about you know, horrific events. Uh, you know, a lot of them said that they, they couldn't tell their families about this. You know, it's not something they were able to talk about, but I, but I knew something of their experience, and they were, they were willing to, uh, to walk that road with me. There's a medic. Jamie Henry, who seems to epitomize the stories of everyone else with whom you've talked. Tell me about Jamie Henry. Yeah, Jamie had a, a, a tremendous impact on my life. And uh, 
You know, Jamie was, uh, I, I found him through this, this uh, collection of records to begin with, and then I sought him out. And Jamie was drafted, and uh, he became a medic, and a, and a very good one. The men who served with him said that, uh, that he was, he was uh, among the, the best soldiers that they had served with. He saved a lot of American lives, and they, they really lauded his performance in the field. Uh, and, and, uh, but, but Jamie saw things in Vietnam that really disturbed him. Uh, he told me that on his first day in the field, he watched as the point man, the, the lead man of his patrol, stopped a young girl on a, on a trail and molested her uh, right there. And, you know, Jamie said to himself, you know, my God, what, what's going on here? And over the next uh, several months, he just saw a litany of atrocities take place. He watched uh, uh, a young boy who was just, uh, you know, detained and beaten and, and shot dead for, for no reason. Uh, an old man who was used for target practice. A prisoner who was beaten up and then thrown off a cliff. Uh, another man who was taken and, and held down to be run over by an armored personnel carrier, basically a small tank. And, and Jamie saw these things. And uh, when he first spoke up about brutality, uh, his life was threatened by fellow unit members. And even his friends came to him and said, look, you have to keep your mouth shut or you're going to get shot in the back during a firefight and no one's going to be the wiser. So Jamie did keep his mouth shut, but he kept his eyes open and he kept cataloging everything he saw. And this culminated in, uh, it was February 8, 1968, and his, uh, his unit moved into a small hamlet. And his, uh, his commanding officer, a West Point trained captain, uh, uh, ordered all the civilians there rounded up. It was about 19 civilians, women and children. And Jamie was taking a break, smoking a cigarette, and over the radio he heard this captain give an order, and it was to kill anything that moves. And Jamie heard this, and he jumped up, and he went to go try and intervene, but he was just seconds late. He showed up just as five men arrayed around these civilians, opened up on full automatic with their M16 rifles, and shot them all dead. And Jamie told me that, uh, that 30 seconds after this took place, he vowed that he would make this public. And, uh, and, and he made it you know, his, his duty to do so. As soon as he got home from Vietnam, he sought out an Army lawyer, and he told him everything he saw. And this army lawyer told him that he needed to, to keep quiet because there were a million ways that the army could make him disappear. He went and spoke to an army criminal investigator, but, uh, but that man threatened him. He went and sought out a civilian lawyer who told him to get some political backing. He wrote to two congressmen. Neither of them returned his letters. Uh, then he started speaking out. He went on the radio. He went to public forums and even the, uh, the Winter Soldier uh, investigation. He spoke out there, but he could never get any traction. And finally, you know, it was years later that Jamie just gave up and uh, you know, he decided that uh, he just had to move on with his life. Until you tracked him down. I showed up on his doorstep with several phone book sized stacks of documents. And this was the first time that, that Jamie knew the Army had investigated uh, his allegations had corroborated everything he said. And in fact, uh, the documents even painted a, a grimmer picture than, than Jamie had told because other members of his unit finally spoke up and they talked about things that, that Jamie hadn't seen, uh, you know, I additional atrocities. So this is where you got the title for your book, Kill Anything That Moves? That's what he overheard? Yes, this, this, was, uh, this was the order that his commanding officer, the, the West Point trained captain, gave. And, and this was the first time that I really took note of the phrase. But then, as I, I continued you know, working on this topic, I noticed it coming up again and again. I realized that this was the order that was given out by, by Captain Medina, the commanding officer right. who, uh, uh, to the troops who carried out the My Lai massacre. That was his order to them, to kill anything that moves. And I found it listed in, uh, in, in court-martial documents from a, mar a Marine Corps massacre that took place in 1967. And it seemed that everywhere I looked, there were variations on it. Shoot anything that moves. Kill anything that breathes. And I came to see it as, as really a shorthand for, for the war. Do you think this will strike some people as old news? Well, I, I think that uh, in some ways, uh, the, the story of atrocities in Vietnam is kind of a, a half-known history. People have, you know, maybe some inkling of it. They, they know a little bit about Mi Lai, or they, they've seen glimpses of, uh, of civilian suffering in Apocalypse Now, or Platoon, or Casualties of War, these movies. But, uh, but uh, I, I, th I think that, you know, the, 
this society and, and the American culture has never uh, fully come to grips with Vietnam. It's, it's this half-known history. There are these hidden and, and forbidden histories that just haven't been fully engaged. So while I think people might know a little bit of it, I, I doubt that they, they know the, the full story as, as I came to know it. It's not just a litany of atrocities. You reach some very significant conclusions about the way the war was fought, how it was not just a, some bad apples that were conducting these brutal acts, but that it was a pattern which was inevitable given the pressures from the top. That's really exactly what I found. When I, when I looked, you know, I, I, I talk about uh, individual micro-level atrocities, things like, like murders and massacres, uh, and they, they do punctuate the book, but really I'm telling the story of civilian suffering and, it, uh, and, and the, the sheer number of Vietnamese who were killed or, or wounded in Vietnam or became refugees. Uh, this wasn't due to, you know, simply bad apples, simply uh, troops on the ground. It was command level policies, things like the use of uh, unrestrained bombing and artillery shelling on heavily populated areas of the countryside, uh, policies that were promulgated at the highest levels of the U.S. military. Uh, this is what made it inevitable that there would be this much civilian suffering, that there would be, you know, an estimated two million Vietnamese civilians killed. I mean, the, the the Vietnam War in Vietnam took such a, a tremendous toll. It's, it's almost, uh, as, as I came to understand, it was almost unfathomable uh, suffering uh, on the part of the Vietnamese people. Um, you know, the, the best estimates that we have are, are 3.8 million Vietnamese deaths overall, combatants and non-combatants, right. uh, 2 million of them civilians, uh, 5.3 million civilian wounded using a very uh, conservative method of, of estimation. The U.S. government came up with a number of 11 million Vietnamese who were made refugees during the war. And the latest studies show that um, up to 4 million Vietnamese were exposed to toxic defoliants like Agent Orange. So this is, I mean, it's, it's suffering on, on, a, on a scale that I don't think that most Americans can, can fully wrap their head around. I was struck by your writing that by the mid-60s, the American military had turned war making into a thoroughly, I'm quoting you, thoroughly corporatized quantitatively oriented system known as techno war. And you say that became in Vietnam the American way of war. And this led to what you call the indiscriminate death of civilians, as well as the atrocities that occurred against individuals. That's right. You know, the, the military fought this war with a, uh, an attrition strategy. Uh, the U.S. was fighting a, a guerrilla war, and, uh, and they were looking for, for a, a metric to show that they were winning. And the attrition strategy provided that by uh, uh, making body count the way that you could tell. Basically, you would kill your way to victory. You would pile up uh, Vietnamese bodies. You would, uh, you would kill more enemy guerrillas than the enemy could put into the field. That was the crossover point. That was the, the famed crossover point. So this crossover point that, uh, that we were supposed to reach when we were killing more Vietnamese than could be replaced led as you point out here step by step to the whole notion of the body count as the measure of success in Vietnam. That's right. Uh, sometimes I found that, uh, you know, American troops would take prisoners in the field and they'd call in, you know, I have a prisoner and the commander would call back, well, I want a body count. And then the prisoner would be killed and then called in as, a, as an enemy who was, who was shot while fleeing or shot during a firefight. You say so entire units would be pitted against each other in body count competitions with prizes at stake. Yes, uh, you know, one veteran that I talked to, he said there was a, a great, uh, he called it an incentivization of death. And uh, I, I talked to many veterans who talked about this. They said that, um, you know, that this really messed with their value system, that they were uh, told that, you know, if, if they, they brought in a, a dead Vietnamese, if they proved a body count, they would get three days of R&R &R at a beach resort uh, in Vietnam, or they would get extra beer, or light duty when they were back at base camp, or medals, badges. Uh, so there were all these incentives that, uh, that were pushing them to, uh, uh, to, to, to produce bodies. And then there were um, disincentives. There were, uh, along with those carrots, there were sticks. They knew if they didn't uh, produce bodies that they'd, be, uh, that they'd have it tougher. They'd be kept out in the field longer. They wouldn't, they'd have to march out instead of getting a, an airlift in a helicopter. Uh, so, so there were real reasons to produce bodies. You describe 
you know, it's almost a sporting event, sports statistics, box scores, uh, and those scores being padded by including civilians. Yeah, there were, um, you know, everywhere in Vietnam there were uh, kill boards, they were called, up that, uh, that, that showed each unit's number of kills. Uh, some men talk about it, you know, the, the being like box scores up in the mess hall in military publications. This, uh, this idea of body count was just drilled into them at, at every turn, uh, and they really couldn't get away from it. I mean, this was, this was the way the war was fought, and it, it turned out to be disastrous for Vietnamese civilians. And so that led, as you say, to the body count as the measure of success. Uh, Nick, you, you make it clear that this pressure that led to this kind of killing came down from the top in Washington as well, from Secretary of Defense McNamara, at the Pentagon and clearly uh, from the White House. I think it did and there was rarely any distinction made between enemies and the civilian population. Uh, they were, uh, you know, the, the, and I should make the point that these are very young men at the time, uh, 18, 19, 20 years old. So they get to boot camp as, as mere boys and they're really told that all the Vietnamese are dangerous and uh, and they learned pretty quickly that it was okay to shoot first because no one was going to ask questions later. How were you affected when you went to Vietnam for the first time? Well, I was, um, it, it really changed, uh, you know, the, the project that I was working on, and, it, and I think it changed me in, in profound ways. I went, so? I went to Vietnam, uh, you know, with these stacks of documents, and I was looking for witnesses and survivors to individual uh, atrocities, the cases that, that I had read about. And, uh, and I, went, I went to these villages and I talked to Vietnamese and I, I, t I was asking them about one specific spasm of violence. But what, I, what they kept telling me, the stories that I kept hearing, was what it was like to live for 10 years under bombs and shells and helicopter gunships and how they had to negotiate their lives around the American war. What it was like to have your home burned down five, six, seven times and to finally give up rebuilding it and start to live a subterranean or semi-subterranean existence in a bomb shelter and have to, uh, you know, have to uh, make all these calculations about how to survive, when to leave the bomb shelter to forage for food or uh, to, to find water or to relieve yourself, when to farm. Uh, and, and all these decisions could have a profound effect. They, your life depended on it and the life of your family. You had to know to get into the bomb shelter in time when artillery started raining down, but you had to get out of there before the American troops came through and started uh, grenading the bunkers uh, because Americans didn't see these as bomb shelters. They saw them as, as enemy bunkers that, that could have be hiding guerrillas. And the Vietnamese lived with this for, for 10 years straight. And as they told me these stories again and again, I realized that this was really the story that I needed to tell, the one of, of Vietnamese civilian suffering, the one you, of... You call it a system of suffering. Yeah, I, you know, with, with all the, uh, the way that the American war was engineered, I think it, it turned it into a, a veritable system of suffering. Did you encounter animosity and anger toward you as an American? I didn't, and uh, it was one of the, the most shocking things to me. That, uh, you know, I would, I would go into a village and I would often be the first uh, American they'd, they'd seen since the war. And, uh, you know, I'd ask them to dredge up the most... Uh, you know, horrific events imaginable, the most horrible days of their lives. And then I'd ask these people to do it again and again to make sure that I got the story exactly right. And afterwards, uh, I would be shocked to find them thanking me, that they would, uh, they expressed a, a great gratitude. They were amazed that an American knew something of the, the story mm -hmm. of what they had lived through, the story of their hamlet. And, and they, they couldn't believe that someone had traveled halfway around the world to, to listen to them. Why are we talking about this? Do we think any good is going to come out of resurrecting the skeletons in the closet and bringing them out and exposing them in your book or in a conversation like this? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that it will have uh, some bearing on the present. You know, the, the U.S. is, of course, involved in, uh, has been involved in, in constant warfare in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, uh, Libya, Yemen, Somalia. Uh, there's uh, you know, military interventions taking place all over the world over the last decade plus. But I don't think that Americans uh, really have a, have a clear picture of those wars and, and what they've meant for, for people overseas, what they've meant to civilians around the world. 
So uh, I hope that, that my book might be able to, uh, you know, to, to add to that conversation, to open Americans' eyes to, to what wars mean uh, for, for people overseas. And if we're asked to send our, uh, our brothers and sisters and, and sons and daughters to war, I think uh, we should have some idea of, of what it means for the, uh, the sons and daughters of, of people overseas. The book is Kill Anything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam. Nick Terse, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me.